Regina Fall's electoral successes in 1932 and 1933 presented an opportunity to promote an economic nationalist narrative rooted within Ireland's formative struggle for independence. Ireland became committed to a native industrial drive supported by protectionist measures designed to allow foreign technologies and ideas into Ireland, but not people. The economic planners in Minister Sean Lamassey's Department for Industry and Commerce were interested in attracting overseas investors who would drive a policy of self-sufficiency and decentralized state-sponsored industrialization. The idea was bring over investors, managers, and experts into Ireland from industrialized countries such as uh, the UK, but mainly in continental Europe, which meant Germany, France, Czechoslovakia, and Belgium. Priority was given to new industries, and proposals were refused if they posed any competition to existing Irish industries. Those of you who know anything about the history of the time would know that this was the sort of um, mix, muddled thinking that was going on um, among the, uh, uh, our leaders. So the only people considered as candidates for setting up in Ireland some sort of industry were those who offered specific manufacturing processes that were new to Ireland. So one area that was a good potential fit for European-based industries to relocate to Ireland was the textile sector, or as it has always been fondly known in Jewish and not just Jewish circles, the schmutter trade. And traditionally, many European textile enterprises were Jewish-owned. In Dublin, too, several Jewish-owned firms figured prominently in the clothing manufacturing sector. One of the Jews in Dublin's schmutter trade was businessman Marcus Whitstam. Born in Poland in 1896, he had spent several years in Argentina and Belgium before settling in Dublin, where he co-owned a shop selling Viennese textiles. When Winston learnt of La Masse's search for European businesses to relocate to Ireland, he spotted a unique opportunity. Knowledgeable about the favorable conditions that Ireland had to offer, Irish social and wage standards, protective tariffs, quota restrictions, Winston was ideally placed to search for suitable candidates to set up new industries here in Ireland. A key mover and shaker in La Masse's circle was Fianna Fáil Senator John Eddie McKellen, a leading industrialist from uh, Bala in County Mayo. McKellen was a strong proponent for industrial projects. And there's a reason for that. As someone who enjoyed high visibility, he was a former illustrious GAA player who had captained Mayo. McKellen would later become the first chairman of the Irish Sugar Company and managing director of Irish press newspapers. So it gives you an indication of uh, where his contacts were. And during the 1930s, one of McKellen's companies delivered material for new factories an early example of the closeness between Fianna Fáil and the construction industry. McKellen used his vast network of political contacts to personal advantage by recommending where new industries should be located. And in 1934, that's a key, a key year, both Whitstam, Marcus Whitstam, and McKellen joined Le Masse's headhunting commission to promote employment in the west of Ireland by bringing businesses from Europe that would create urgently needed job opportunities. Whitstam started visiting Europe regularly, often with Lamas and McKellen in tow. When the Council of German Jewry 
sent a memorandum to the Irish government in 1936 regarding the possibility of Jewish refugee industrialists contributing to the Irish economy, which them made certain that Lamas responded in the affirmative. With guile and chutzpah, Whitstam set about successfully navigating Lamassey's commission in the direction of Jewish-owned businesses in Europe. And his first success was in Paris, where he met Henri Orbach, who owned a small hat factory, Les Modes Modernes. In the late 1920s, even before Hitler came to power, Orbach's sister Sophie and her husband Serge Philipson were strolling through a Berlin park when two German brown shirts shoved Sophie into some bushes. On the spot, Serge announced, I am not staying in this city one more day, we are leaving. So the Philipsons moved to Paris, where Orbach invited Serge to join Les Modes Modernes. When Winston came knocking on Orbach's door to persuade him to relocate his hat factory to the west of Ireland, Orbach decided to send his brother-in-law, Serge, on a reconnaissance mission. Meanwhile, the Galway Industrial Development Association, GIDA for short, had just lost out on a new factory in the city that would have employed 50 people. It was a sign of the times that losing the possibility of employing 50 people was such a big deal back in those days. Today, we'd be upset if 500 jobs suddenly weren't going to materialize. 50 was the criterion there. And the reason for the lost opportunity was that the promoters had failed to find suitable premises for these 50 people in, um, in Galway. So when the GIDA heard that there was the prospect of Galway hosting a French hat factory, they were determined that Galway would not lose out a second time. Backed by Erskine Childers, Secretary of the National Agricultural and Industrial Development Association, the Galway people pushed hard for their city to be chosen as the site for the hat factory. <coughs> When Serge arrived on his uh, reconnaissance mission to Galway, he reported back enthusiastically to his brother-in-law, Orbach, that Galway presented, and I quote, the opportunity of a lifetime. It was agreed that Serge himself would oversee the establishment of the Le Mode Modern Hat Factory in Galway. The plan was Serge would return to Paris after five years, once it was feasible to install an Irish manager in the Galway hat factory. Because Serge's wife, Sophie, insisted on staying in Paris with her widowed mother and their daughter, Rachel, Serge spent one week a month in Paris. Every holidays, his wife and daughter would join him in Galway. April the 10th, 1937, it was officially announced that a hat factory would be established in Galway. Two-thirds of the £60,000 capital came from the Orbach Group and the rest from local investors. The building materials for the factory, of course, were supplied by McKellen. Another investor in the Galway factory was Edmund Clessens, a prominent Catholic politician and former Belgian senator. Whitstam, McKellen and Orbach were among the directors. Whitstam probably knew Clessons from the time that Whitstam had lived in Antwerp. So as well as business partners in the new venture, the three Jews, Whitstam, Orbach and Philipson became firm friends. And during the period that the hat factory in Beaumont, on the northeastern edge of Galway, opposite the new cemetery, was under construction, hat production started in mid-August 1937 in temporary premises on Air Square. A showcase, not far from here, in Dublin St. Stephen's Green, gave people an opportunity to see what the Galway factory had to offer. 
At the official opening ceremony in Galway's old railway hotel on the 18th of July, 1938, Minister Lamas said that Irish industries had now passed their infancy stage and, I quote, were capable of facing comparison with industries in other countries. The new hat factory was blessed by Michael Brown, Bishop of Galway, and a known supporter of Fianna Fáil. The bishop gave Les Maudes Modernes a significant publicity boost when he announced from the pulpit that his lady parishioners should henceforth wear hats instead of headscarves to church. A very significant promotional boost. Whitstam continued his forays to Europe to find experts who would ensure the full professional operation of the new hat factory in Galway. And among the technicians that Whitstam sourced were several Jews. Wolf Zeiler, the works manager, Matilda Schwenk, the chief designer, hat makers Joseph Miritinsky, sorry, <coughs> Miritinsky, Heinrich Bittgen and Bertha Mortel, and Theodore Honig, who trained the local staff. Whitstam also made sure that some of the so-called experts brought over from Europe to Les Maudes Modernes in the guise of supervisors were Jews from a professional and upper-class background with little or no experience in industry. And as war clouds gathered in Europe in the summer of 1939, Serge Philipson begged his wife Sophie to come to Ireland. She was reluctant to leave her mother, who in any case would never have received a visa to come to Ireland. July 1939, Serge joined the family for a vacation in Le Touquet, uh, Paris Plage, close to the Belgian-German border. Uh, July 1939 is very close to the bone. A worried Henri Orbach urged the family to move away from the border. Serge had to return to Les Maudes Modernes in Galway, leaving Sophie and Rachel in France. In August 1939, Sophie, Rachel and four other family members left Paris, Paris for Cabourg in Normandy. The war breaks out 1st of September 1939. Rachel and Sophie were still able to correspond with Serge here, of course, because Ireland was neutral. But once Nazi Germany occupied France in July 1940, the Philipson family moved to Neri and settled in the French Free Zone in the, valley, in the village of uh, Cotteret on the border with Spain. Here they were reun reunited with Serge's brother, Robert Philipson. August 1942, Sophie's sister Ella and her husband Ernest their daughter Ruth, Serge's, Serge's brother Robert and sister Esther were all arrested by French police. I stress French police, not, um, not, not, gendarme, not uh, Nazi uh, uh, soldiers, and deported and were never heard of again. Early 1943, Sophie, her mother Augusta and Rachel moved down to the south of the country where they joined Henri Orbach in the Hotel Victoria in Cannes. So that's very deep south. Didn't help them much because in January 1944, Henri, Sophie and Augusta were denounced, arrested, transferred to Marseille and sent by train to Drancy a transit camp from where they were deported to a Nazi death camp in Poland. There's a parallel here with Ireland's only um, Holocaust victim, um, Etty Steinberg, the only Irish citizen to perish in the Holocaust. She too was staying in a hotel in the south of France with her husband and son. She too was denounced, arrested, taken to Dronsey and murdered. The sole survivor of the Orbach Philipson family was Serge's daughter, Rachel, who managed to hide during the war. 
She returned to liberated Paris in August 1944 and contacted her father Serge in Ireland. He persuaded his friend, his friend the French commercial attaché in Dublin, Mr. Lestercoy, to personally travel to Paris to organize Rachel's repatriation to Ireland. That's quite remarkable. He, he persuades a French diplomat to travel to France to bring his daughter back. And when Rachel finally arrived in Dublin in June 1945, Serge, Serge was waiting at the quayside with a bouquet of pink roses. It was a highly emotional reunion. Six years had elapsed since they had last seen one another. Rachel married in 1951 and emigrated to Montreal in 1954. Sluggish demand led to the liquidation of Les Modes Modernes in the 1970s. Serge went on to become an art director and was elected to the board of directors of Ireland's National Gallery. He was never acknowledged in Ireland, but he was awarded the Légion d'honneur <coughs> because of his involvement with the Alliance Française. We move on to the second of <coughs> Marcus Whitstam's success stories. He was instrumental in bringing to Ireland Hugo Reiniger & Co, a hat manufacturer in Shomotov, a German-speaking town in the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia. There was great excitement in Castle Bar, County Mayo, when it was announced that a new factory for the millinery trade was to be established. Western Hats was to be one of the largest in the country and was registered in Ireland as a public company with a nominal capital of £100,000, a lot of money in the 1930s. One of the chief promoters was our Belgian friend, the, the former senator, um, Senator Clessens, um, who was, of course, an investor in the other hat factory, Les Mort Modern, in Galway. In May 1939, Clessens was given the honour of digging the first sod of turf in Castle Bar. The board of directors of Western Hats included, and here come some names you're familiar with already, McKellen and Whitstam, no surprise there, as well as Franz Schmolka, the general manager of the factory. Construction began on a nine-acre site on the Newport Road, a few minutes walk from Castle Bar's main street, a few months before the outbreak of World War II. The difficulty of getting supplies posed challenges to the builders, but the energy and foresight and good connections of Senator McKellen overcame the obstacles. Two local contractors carried out the main construction work. The factory took six months to build and was the first building of its kind west of the Shannon. The 350-foot red brick chimney remained a local landmark for Castle Bar and its surroundings up to the 1980s. Everything ran on natural sources, turf, water, steam, daylight, and the factory was the first building of its kind to use natural resources. The last machines arrived from Belgium just one week before Belgium was overrun by the Nazis. On the last Friday in August 1940, the factory boiler was put into commission for the very first time, and with its modern lines and its green latticed windows, the Castle Bar Hat Factory was one of the most modern in the country and would become one of the largest employers in the region, creating employment for hundreds. Many Castle Bar families grew up on stories of family members with fond memories of the factory. There was even a Western Hats football team that competed in a local league. The Hat Factory was initially run under the careful eye of Mr. Schmolka, who was from Prague, and soon shops in Castle Bar were selling an excellent range of hats made by locals out of the very finest of materials in the latest style and shade and at very reasonable prices. In Castle Bar, just like in um, Galway, many of the so-called experts 
at Western Hats were Jews from a professional and upper-class background with zero experience in industry. Fred Klepper, some of you here knew Fred, was a marketing manager who had moved from the Sudetenland to Prague. He heard about the hat factory in Castle Bar and received a work permit even though he had no actual skills in the making of hats. With their Irish visas in their hands, Fred and his wife Gretel and their daughter Doris, Doris died just a couple of weeks ago, reached Castle Bar in the summer of 1939. Fred began work in the spinning department of the hat factory and the family moved to an area of Castle Bar that the locals called Little Jerusalem, just like this area was called Little Jerusalem. I want to read you some lines from a Holocaust <coughs> poem called The Hat Factory by Irish poet Paul Durkin. Many years ago he read this at the um, annual uh, Holocaust Memorial Day event. And what if you were a hatter, and you married a hatter, and all your sons and daughters worked as hatters, and you inhabited a hat house all full of hats. Hats, 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 hats. The apotheosis of an ancient craft, and I think of all the nationalities of Israel, and of how each always clings to his native hat, his priceless and movable roof, his hat which is the last and first symbol of a man's slender foothold on this earth. Meanwhile, Marcus Whitstam was still busy negotiating for a third factory to move from Europe to Ireland. Emil Hirsch, who was born into a wealthy Jewish Viennese family, had served in the Austrian army in World War I and had taken over an unsuccessful textile factory in Vienna. Hirsch renamed it Hirsch Bandfabrik, the Hirsch Ribbon Factory. As the political situation in Austria deteriorated in the 1930s, Hirsch wanted to relocate his factory and his family to safer pastures. And when he learned that Ireland was offering incentives to foreign industrialists to set up business in Ireland, he opened negotiations with the Irish government, which were represented naturally by Whitstam and McKelly. He has originally planned to build his ribbon factory in Galway, and anyone thinking of doing that should heed what he said. He decided that the climate in Galway was too wet and not good for silk. <laughs> Local interest groups in Longford, mostly with Fianna Fáil connections, invited Whitstam and McKellen to visit the town in February 1939 for them to get a taste of the local conditions. Longford was actually an ideal location. It had road, rail and canal transport, water from the Camden River and a plentiful supply of potential employees, of course. Once again, Erskine Childers, this time wearing a different hat, he was the Fianna Fáil TD for Athlone Longford and Secretary of the Federation of Irish Manufacturers. He spearheaded the campaign to locate Hirsch's factory in Longford. Childers used his Department of Industry and Commerce contacts to secure Longford for the factory and he proudly announced to the Longford Development Association that he, he had persuaded McKellen and Whitstam to choose Longford as the site of Hirsch's ribbon factory. Childers also used his contacts in the Department of Defense, nothing's changed, has it? <laughs> um, to secure a vacant section of Connolly Army Barracks on Battery Road in Longford Town. March 1939, the Department of Finance signed a 30 year <coughs> lease agreement with McKellen and Whitstam for the Longford site. After paying considerable bribes to Nazi and SS officials, and even spending some <coughs> days in prison in Vienna, Hirsch became the only Jew in Austria who successfully shipped his entire factory out of Austria after the Nazi Anschluss. By May 1939, 
The stock of ribbons and 21 looms arrived safely. Hirsch Ribbons was incorporated as a limited company in July 1939. Hirsch Ribbons Limited was the first industrial establishment in Longford and remained an influential economic and social institution for almost four decades. It will not surprise you to learn that the board of directors included Hirsch, Childers, McKellen and Whitstone. There was an urgent need to train workers. Hirsch and Whitstam used this as an excuse to seek and receive the immediate granting of visas for other employees of the Austrian Hirsch factory to come to Ireland. Hirsch became the managing director. His son Robert, who spoke excellent English, was appointed general manager. And to facilitate communication between the mainly German-speaking managers and the local staff, the company recruited an Irish girl, Ruby Burns, who had studied in Germany and spoke fluent German. Ruby was later to become Robert's wife and their two children, Desmond and Jenny. Some of you will know Desmond and Jenny. Both worked in the factory and later in the Dublin sales office. Local Longford media lauded the employment potential of the ribbon factory. Not unexpectedly, the media played down the anti-Semitic causes of Hirsch's exodus from Vienna. Hirsch lived in Dublin, and he ran the business from 24 Suffolk Street, which just happened to be Whitstam's office. You see, Western Hats Limited of Castle Bar, Hirsch Ribbons Limited of Longford, and Le Maud Modern Limited in Galway all had their office, their head office, in the same place. Once the Hirsch Ribbon Factory at Longford started production in October 1939, part of the merchandise was earmarked exclusively for the other two, for the two hat factories in Galway and in Castle Bar. Whitstam personally coordinated production at all three businesses. Hirsch and his ribbon factory feature in 17 Martin Street. For those of you who don't know, it's just a minute round the corner. This was Marilyn Taylor's fact-based novel about Jewish refugees in Ireland during World War II. One Jewish family closely associated with Hirsch ribbons was the Clars or the Clares. George Clare's adventures and misadventures are recorded in his best-selling memoir, Last Waltz in Vienna, highly, highly recommended reading, which won the 1982 W.H. Smith Literary Award. When George's father, Ernst, lost his job in his Viennese bank because he was a Jew, the non-Jewish owner, of associated Austrian ribbon factories, put him in contact with a Jewish competitor, Emil Hirsch. At Hirsch's insistence, Ernst, this is Ernst Klar, Claire, who had never stepped foot in a factory, was deemed an expert who was urgently needed in the Longford ribbon factory. George and his parents followed Whitstone's instructions and went to collect their visas from the passport and visa section of the Irish legation in Berlin. And some of you know what's coming next. This section was headed by the notorious anti-Semite, the Irish consul Charles Bewley. Bewley claimed that he had received no instructions from Dublin regarding the class. Whitstam and Hirsch bombarded the Irish authorities with demands that the class be given visas. In the meantime, Ernst received an offer of a job from the bank from which he had been dismissed in Vienna in Paris, and he decided he was going to take up that offer. In the meantime, the Irish visas for Stella, uh, Claire, and George, the son, miraculously materialized when? On the 10th of November, 1938, the morning after Kristallnacht. 
Bewley's German secretary, the Irish legation, stamped their passport with Irish visas. These visas had been issued several days earlier and Bewley had blatantly withheld them. A quick aside about Bewley. A few years ago, I attended the opening of a singular exhibition <coughs> in Berlin's Jewish Museum. The curator there had come up with a novel idea. She contacted all the countries that had diplomats in Berlin in November 1938 and asked them, asked the governments or the Foreign Service to send a copy of the reports sent by these diplomats in Berlin on what they had seen during Kristana. It's a very novel idea. Even the Italian, Spanish and Japanese diplomats had been shocked at what they witnessed. And the sole foreign diplomat in Berlin who sent back a report exonerating the Nazis and condemning the Jews was, you've guessed it, Charles Bewley. And the curator of the museum told me how shocked she and her staff were to make this discovery and Bewley's disgusting report was prominently displayed in the Berlin Museum. Back to the class. Stella and her son George traveled to Longford, ostensibly to work in the ribbon factory. In Longford, George even shared an apartment with Hirsch's son Robert. Through Whitstam's intervention and pushing, Ernst eventually received his Irish visa to work in the Longford ribbon factory but he made the tragic decision to stay with his bank job in Paris. Stella missed her husband so much that she left the safety of Ireland and joined Ernst in Paris and her timing was absolutely awful. She arrived in Paris the day after World War II broke up. Ernst was repeatedly interned by the French and then by the Vichy authorities, was arrested by the French police, again police, in August 1942. He was deported to Auschwitz where he and Stella, Stella was never meant to be arrested, but she refused to uh, allow him to be arrested without her and they both perished in Auschwitz. The common threat that links all three factories we've looked at this afternoon. Western Hats Limited in Castle Bar, Hearst Ribbons Limited in Longford, and Le Maud Modern Limited in Galway is, of course, Marcus Whitstam. It was Whitstam with his close links with the European textile sector who quickly spotted the mutual needs of the Irish economy and the plight of Jews in Europe. It was Whitstam who exploited a convergence of circumstances to relocate the three Jewish-owned textile factories to Ireland, where they created over 600 jobs, a huge number in those days. It was part of Whitstam's genius that the Jewish-owned factories being set up in Ireland needed experts from Europe to train the local employees. And it was Whitstam's genius that the industries moving to Ireland were Jewish industries, thus circumventing Ireland's stringent exclusion policy regarding bringing in Jewish refugees. Typically, the local Irish media presented the arrival of these Jewish refugees, these industrial experts, through a lens of serving the larger Irish project of nation building and the foreign experts were described as conduits of modern industrial processes in the transference of new skills to Irish workers. There was no mention um, that these experts were Jews fleeing, uh, fleeing from Hitler and of course the non-mention worked to the Jews' advantage. So successful was Whitstam in combining his business activities and his humanitarian activities, that it is estimated that the Jews who found employment in the hat and ribbon factories accounted for about half 
Of all the Jews who sought sanctuary from the Holocaust in Ireland, and this at a time when Ireland made such strenuous efforts to keep Jews out. In this very room, the late Joe Briscoe stated that he was glad that his father, Robert Briscoe, TD, the Fianna Fáil politician and former Lord Mayor of Dublin, Joe said he was glad his father had died before the papers were released showing that the Department of Justice officials and ministers had consistently lied to Robert Briscoe. Their promises that they were making efforts to follow up on his multiple requests for named individuals to escape the impending Holocaust by getting visas for Ireland were a total sham. When I recently gave a radio interview about Whitstone to RTE's Leap of Faith, the presenter, Michael Comyn, remarked that the Whitstone story reminded him of Schindler's List, and the parallels are striking. Both Schindler and Whitstone exploited the realms of industry and employment to save Jews from the Holocaust. Later this week, I will be attending an event in Dublin called Beyond Duty, an exhibition on the diplomats recognized as righteous among the nations. That's the um, accolade that Yad Vashem in Jerusalem gives to non-Jews who helped Jews during the Holocaust. This exhibition will honor Sempo Subihara, the Japanese vice consul in Lithuania during the war, who issued transit visas to six thousand Jews to reach Japanese territory, thus risking his job and his family's lives. Mr. Sugihara is the only Japanese citizen to be recognized as a righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem, and the only Irish citizen to be so honored is Mary Elms for her work in France to save Jewish lives. Now, Marcus Whitstam, of course, was Jewish. So he is not eligible to receive a Righteous Among the Nations award. But if Japan can honor Mr. Sugihara, a true Holocaust hero whose noble deeds are now being acknowledged, surely it is only fitting that the Irish state should honor Marcus Whitstam, a true Holocaust hero whose noble deeds have yet to be acknowledged. I hereby publicly call on Ireland to do the right thing. Thank you very much.